Joe Biden is wrapping up his whirlwind tour of Vietnam as he wraps up most engagements these days by muttering listlessly before shuffling off the stage. And uh, let's see. I'll just follow my orders here. Uh, Staff, if anybody hasn't spoken, uh, I ain't calling on you. I'm calling on you. I said there are five questions. Anita, VOA. Oh, yeah, Anita, v- VOA. He opens up. He says, Hey, where's the staff? Where was I supposed? Who was I supposed to call on? Uh, I can't find who I was supposed to call on. All right, does anyone have questions? And then some of the actual reporters who might ask potentially a challenging question raise their hands. He says, "No, no, not you. I'm not calling on you. Who was I, who was I supposed to call on? Of anyway. All right, bye." The worst part of Biden's performance is not the senility, which we've all known about for years, and it's not even the cynicism, which we've all known about for decades. It's the transparency. Biden isn't even trying to hide his unaccountability. He isn't even trying to pretend to take serious questions from an independent press. He isn't even really claiming to be running the show. In some ways, transparency is worse than deceit. At least if Biden were trying to deceive us into thinking that he's really in charge and responsive to the people, at least it would signal that he respects our intelligence or that he cares what we think. But he doesn't. He jokes about his irresponsibility. He doesn't campaign. He doesn't act as though he needs our votes. And maybe that's because with all the recent changes to our electoral system, he doesn't. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. We've got really important news. Miley Cyrus is opening up about her divorce, but we're, we're going to push that pressing national news just a little bit to get to more of uh, Biden because yesterday was obviously the anniversary of the September 11th terror attacks. Very traumatic day for everybody my age and older and a, a day of you know, in- incredible historical significance for people who are younger than me, who don't really remember what happened. And Joe Biden decided to mark that day also by not remembering what happened. Ground Zero in New York. And I remember standing there the next day and looking at the building. I felt like I was looking through the gates of hell. It looked so devastating because the way you could, from where you could stand. That didn't happen. On September 12th, Uh, Joe Biden was in Washington, D.C., and he was voting in the Senate and the Capitol on a resolution to condemn the World Trade Center attacks. He probably believes, maybe he believes that he was in New York on that day. I actually think it's, it's not that he knows that he's lying. And it's also not that he is totally bought into the lie that he actually believes that it's true. I think there's a third possibility here, which is that Joe Biden doesn't care if what he says is true. That's that's called cynicism. It's between deceit and senility. There, there is this place where Joe Biden has lived for his entire political career, and it's cynicism, indifference to the truth. Pontius Pilate is probably the typical cynic who, when he's confronted by Christ, who says, I am the truth, Pilate says, what is truth? Oh, what is truth? Come on, there's no such thing as truth. I think that's where Joe Biden is. He just doesn't, he'll just say whatever sounds good. And maybe he believes it, maybe he doesn't. I think he just doesn't really care. And when you're in a place where the politicians 
are often going to mislead you. But when you're in a place where they don't even care, they're not even conscious of the fact that they're misleading you, for whom words are just sounds that sometimes make people feel more inclined to like you and applaud, rather than words constituting meaningful speech with which we can deliberate and come to rational conclusions about the world and and decide on a program of, for the entire political community, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, how are we going to flourish? When we get to a point where words are just sounds, we are reduced to just grunting baboons. We've ceased to live in human society. I don't want to be too hyperbolic about it, but the fact that that speech has been robbed of its meaning, the fact that we are no longer even scandalized when our politicians lie to us, or even more scandalous, don't care about the truth at all, that accounts for a great deal of our present political problems. There are always political problems in every society, but ours right now are different and worse than they have been in the past. Now, speaking of presidents and the presidential race, President Trump, the chief rival to Joe Biden right now, has just received a really, really big endorsement. This from South Dakota Governor Christy Noem. It is my honor to present to you the man in the arena. He is a man of significance. He is the leader, the fighter that our country needs. He has my full and complete endorsement for President of the United States of America. I will do everything I can to help him win and save this country. Ladies and gentlemen, the 45th and the 47th President of the United States, Donald J. There you have it. I generally have not covered endorsements. I mentioned early on when DeSantis was getting some, some congressmen because they were some of the first endorsements that he had gotten, people who decided to turn on Trump and go for another guy. I haven't really covered many of the endorsements since then. The reason I'm covering this one, the reason that this one is significant is because Christy Noem is not just a Republican governor. She was a potential presidential candidate. Christy Noem, like Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, was obviously considering running for president herself. She set herself up to do that during COVID. She was playing kind of coy with it after COVID, right up until a couple days ago, I guess. Now she's decided that she's going to endorse Trump, which to me says not only that she thinks that Trump is the best candidate, which is explicitly what she's saying, but what it, what it means is she believes that Trump just is going to be the nominee. And so she thinks not only is it her interest to get on Trump's side in this battle between him and DeSantis and Vivek and Chris Christie or whoever, but she thinks it's in her interest not to run against him. Trust me, if Christy Noem thought that Donald Trump had any weakness right now and that she would have a shot at the presidency, she would be running. Inside every governor is a president just waiting to get out. Some uncharitable people have asked how many governors, how many presidents are waiting inside of Chris Christie, which I don't, that's not very nice. That's not, that's not a nice thing to say at all. But Christy Noem wants to be president and she's not going to run and she is going to endorse this guy because she thinks in another sign of something we've been talking about for weeks that the presidential primary is, if not over, pretty severely tilted in the direction of Donald John Trump. Okay, this is a man who likes to have his name written in gold all over the United States, all over the world. And when you want gold, you got to check out Birch Gold. Right now, text Knowles to 989898. Vladimir Putin called the U.S. dollar's drop in dominance, quote, objective and irreversible, as Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa formally agreed to use local currencies in trade instead of the U.S. dollar. As demand for the dollar weakens, the buying power of the dollar weakens. That is why Birch Gold is busier than ever. Investors and savers are looking to harness the power of physical gold held in a tax-sheltered IRA. You can too. You can protect your IRA or 401k by diversifying with gold from Birch Gold. As the U.S. dollar continues to receive pressure from foreign countries, digital currency and central banks arm yourself with information on how to protect your savings. Learn if gold is right for you, too. Text Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to 989898. They will send you a free info kit on gold. With an A-plus rating, with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of happy customers, and countless five-star reviews, I trust Birch Gold to help you diversify into gold. If central bank digital currency becomes a reality, it will be nice to have some gold to depend on. Right now, text Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to 989898. Speaking of presidential candidates, Vivek Ramaswamy has just come out 
another step in his bold campaign to not play it safe, to keep shaking things up, to take to take strong stances on policy issues. Vivek has just come out against birthright citizenship. So I would end birthright citizenship for illegal immigrants. But not children, for illegal immigrants? And the children of illegal immigrants. Well, what does it mean for everybody else? I mean, mm-hmm. we're all citizens, whether sixth generation or first generation in my case. If you're born in this country, you have citizenship if you're born under legal circumstances. But I think that if somebody comes to this country illegally and has a child while here, I do think we have to end birthright citizenship. But does that mean you deport like a one-year-old? I think you would, you would do the family. You would take the whole family unit. So, so I'm strongly opposed to policies that would separate kids from their parents. I think that that was discussed even in, in the Trump administration and otherwise as a tactic for deterring people from coming. As a pro-family leader, I will not adopt such a policy, Mm -hmm. but we will send back the family unit as such. And I think that if you came to this country illegally, the right answer is you have to be sent back to your country of origin, come back through the same legal means, getting in the same line that everybody who's coming into this country legally is already pursuing. I tend to agree. I think he makes a good point here. And you're going to have some people, mostly on the left, but even some people on the right, who say, how dare you? Birthright citizenship is a core bedrock principle of this country. You're up and... Well, it's not, actually. It's not. A lot of what a lot of people believe about the Constitution and American history and the American form of government is not true. A lot of it is revisionism from the middle of the 20th century. And this would be a good example of that. I'm not saying that it's clear from the text of the Constitution that the children born to illegal immigrants on U.S. soil are not citizens. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I think it's pretty clearly an open legal question. Here's the text. The text that we have is from the 14th Amendment is all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Now, the, the key here is subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Obviously, anybody who is on American soil ever is subject to the jurisdiction of the U.S. in a certain sense, in that when you travel to foreign places, you have to observe the laws of those places. But they are not subject to the jurisdiction in the, the full sense, in that they are not citizens of that country. There are clear exceptions to this uh, issue made by, determined by the courts over time. Uh, Native Americans were not subject. Uh, Children of diplomats, not subject. Uh, Occupying soldiers, not subject to the jurisdiction thereof. And therefore, all of their children did not automatically receive birthright citizenship. But it's been debated for a very long time now. The case that, that most clearly weighed in on this was uh, from 1898. It was U.S. versus Wong Kim Ark, which uh, seemed to determine the matter on the side of birthright citizenship. But it, it remains an open question, and it gets to something we were talking about yesterday, which is we look to statutes, we look to constitutional interpretation, we look even back before the founding of our country. We look to the common law tradition, which is another place where we get some evidence for birthright citizenship, though it's a little bit different when we're talking about whether or not someone is born the subject to a king, which is what we get from the English common law tradition, versus a citizen of a republic such as the United States, which entails, one might argue, many more privileges and many fewer responsibilities. Uh, It's an open question, and the answers are not always clear, and changing political circumstances sometimes change the way that eternal principles can be applied in politics. That's why politics is different from uh, archaeology. That's why politics is different from history. That's why politics is different from philosophy, because there are changing circumstances in the present that we're in. So not only are we interpreting documents, but we are writing the script as well. And it is simply a fact that 7.5% Of all births in the United States, we're talking about 300,000 births per year, are to illegal aliens. Seven and a half percent. That's in addition to the millions of foreigners just entering our country illegally and changing our political structure. Then their children, who account for seven and a half percent of all U.S. births per year, all of that population growth— 7.5% are going to be U.S. citizens. That is a radical changing of 
the demographics of the United States and a radical changing of the citizenship, which is a radical changing of the political order. That's why the Democrats are encouraging it. And I know I got in trouble a little bit for pointing out that sometimes we need to be a little uh, more willing to wield power in the cases of emergencies that, that threaten the entirety of the law. Not just one minor aspect of the law, but the entirety of the law, the entirety of the political community. This might be a good example of that, where if, if you have, contrary to the letter of the law and certainly to the spirit of the law, where you have a, a, a foreign invasion radically changing your political community, which in a republic, by the way, means you're changing the whole thing because we're supposed to have self-government here. Well, in that case, we might need to clarify what exactly is meant by, by all persons born or naturalized in the United States or citizens of the United States. Because we know the 14th Amendment was passed over the question of slavery. That's what it was about. The 14th Amendment has absolutely nothing to do with Guatemalan economic migrants pouring across the border, the border which will not be defended by Democrats because they know that it will give them political advantage, and which won't be defended even by the Chamber of Commerce Republicans because they want to get cheap labor. We know that, okay? So maybe we need to be willing to wield power. Or We can just sit on our hands and we can whine and complain and we can say, oh, if only the Democrats would support the border. I mean, we're not going to do anything about it because, you know, U.S. versus Wong Kim Ark in 1898 said that we can't. So we're just going to we're just going to sit there. It's the same thing as the people who say, well, we can't we can't regulate Google because you see, if we Google is controlling the entire public square and all of our speech in the society. But, you know, look, if we regulate Google that's a private business. They can do whatever they want. Well, then maybe the liberals will regulate our businesses, which they're already doing. Well, if we impose certain boundaries on and and manage the way that speech is governed in our society, well, the left might do that too, which they're obviously already doing. That's the whole point. That's the problem we have to address. Okay. And that's a big, that's a big issue because if you sit on your hands long enough, seven and a half percent of all births per year, you just have a new country (laughs) at a certain point. And Vivek sees that. And Vivek is dealing. This is why he's a candidate who is largely favored by by younger conservatives who recognize that Ronald Reagan's a great guy. Bill Buckley's a great guy. We love our we love our 20th century conservatives, but we have new challenges now. They dealt with their challenges. We have new challenges now, and we need to handle them ourselves. Now, speaking of people in places that they don't belong, there's a fella. Very, very important for all of you, for women, and, and especially for men. Is your hair thinning? Then you got to check out Provia. Right now, go to proviahair.com slash Knowles. Are you one of the millions of American men and women dealing with premature hair thinning and hair loss? Well, maybe you're scared about inheriting that thinning look because it runs in the family. Finally, there is a real solution that delivers on its promise without the harsh side effects, unwanted chemicals, and unpleasant smells. Provia Hair Care uses a safe, natural ingredient called Procapil to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and loss. Provia supports healthy scalp circulation and delivers nourishing nutrients to strengthen hair follicles and anchor them to your scalp. Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower drain. Provia is effective for men and women of any age and safe on colored, treated, and styled hair. Provia works guaranteed or 100% of your money back. It is that easy. You know, I have relied on my hair a lot in my public life. Right now, new customers save over 50% off Provia's introductory package at proviahair.com slash Knowles. See results for yourself right now. Do not wait. Proviahair.com slash Knowles. If you're even mildly familiar with this show, you're probably aware of my autumnal affinity for a certain seasonal beverage. I am a certified aficionado of the PSL, the Pumpkin Spice Latte. I am a swarthy Italian man for nine months of the year. But then when fall rolls around, I transform, I transition into a very pale, basic white girl in a North Face jacket and an infinity scarf. So what better way to bring the fall atmosphere into your home than with the all-new Michael Knowles Pumpkin Spice Candle? That's right, baby. It's wonderful. It's filled with, hmm, it's filled with cinnamon and presumably pumpkin spice. 
It's now available in my collection at dailywire.com slash shop. These are going to sell out fast. I'm sure I know that they are. Uh, they're probably sold out already by the time you're listening. to. This. If you do want one, go, go get it right now. Uh, and then uh, also speaking of my collection, Yes or No, The Game has sold out again. Uh, so I warned you, don't say I didn't tell you so, all right? I always tell you this, and it, it uh, did sell out. So I hate to say it, but that's the way it goes. Uh, it will come back in stock. You need to secure your game if you have not already, especially as we start to approach Thanksgiving and the Christmas season. They're going to sell even faster. If you already have the game, be sure to get the all-new Conspiracy Theory expansion pack in time for spooky season. Do not wait. Order your pumpkin spice candles and your yes or no game over at dailywire.com slash shop today. Speaking of, that's not authoritarian. That's just. That's liberal in the truest sense of the word. That's good. That's right. That's the point of being a citizen in a self governing republic. <laughs> Come on. Ah. All right. That rant is over, but we're still speaking of women's issues, and we get to. Miley Cyrus. You know I'm a Miley fan. I mean, I don't listen to her music. I don't really listen to any modern music, but it, I kind of get a kick out of her because she says things that are at least contrary to what the liberals always believe sometimes. And I think she's got a good voice. And I always loved Party in the USA. So here is Miley Cyrus explaining her divorce. I have to slow down because this is like actually serious. So Glastonbury was in June, which was when the decision had been made that me and Liam's commitment to being married just really came from, of course, a place of love first, because we've been together for 10 years, but also from a place of trauma and just trying to rebuild as quickly as we could. The day of the show was the day that I had decided that it was no longer going to work in my life to be in that, in that relationship. So that was another moment where the work, the performance, the character came first. And I guess that's why it's now so important to me for that to not be the case, that the human comes first. Notice how clinical and controlled Miley is here. If you're listening to this, and I bring up this story not because I care about celebrity gossip with Miley Cyrus, but because it, it tells you a lot about how to engage in society and a lot about how our political order works. Miley is reading off an iPad. She's, she's got her words written out perfectly here, and she's being very controlled. She goes, and, I, and that was the moment at which I decided that this relationship was not going to work in my life. And it's all this really vague clinical language. But then she says, she goes, look, I've always just worked, okay? And the show must go on. And I was working, and I was working too much. And I, I think she's implying here the reason her marriage fell apart was because she and her husband just were too focused on their careers and just always put their work, which is show business, first above everything else. I think that's what a lot of people do. A lot of people put their jobs first. That's a cause of a lot of marital strain. A lot of people put their careers first and their education and their settling into their professional life first. That's why they don't get married until sometimes it's too late or it's much more difficult to get married. This is why they don't have kids. They put off having kids until very often it's too late. And it's a, it's a lie. It's, it's a scam, and they come to regret it, and the, the, the people who get suckered in by even something that seems noble, you know, getting on your hustle and working hard and putting the show first, even they will come to regret that very often. Because you want to work hard, and you want to be serious in your professional life, and you want to have good material means, but that's not everything, okay? You want to put on a good show. Everybody's performing these days. Not only are we at the point of society where everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes, everyone is famous, at least at a local level, whenever they want to be, because we're always all performing for TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and whatever, Twitter. So we're all always performing. Sometimes we put that show first. And this reminds me of a line that a, a Dante professor of mine told me once in Italy. You know, I was brief, in my wayward youth, I was briefly a professional actor. And this Dante professor of mine, he said, you know, yes, uh, Migaluzzo, I, uh, I wanted to be an actor as a young boy. I took it very seriously. Uh, my mother discouraged it. She told me, there's the door you want to be an actor. There's the door. But I thought about it. And I, and I, I felt so sorry for him. And I said, oh, no. 
professor, you, you never got to be an actor. You never got to live out your dream. And he said, ah, Megaruzzo, I used to want to be an actor, but now I am the real thing. And I love that line. I use that line. Yeah, yeah, I used to be an actor. Now I'm the real thing, and it's better to be the real thing. It's very nice to play a married woman on a sitcom or in a movie. I'm sure Miley Cyrus enjoys doing that. It is better to actually be a wife and a mother. It's better to be the real thing. It's true for men, too. I'm sure it's fun being a rock. I've never been a rock star, but I'm sure it's fun to be a rock star and to play this, this kind of character where you're just beloved by everybody. It's better to be beloved by your family who actually will continue to care for you once the music dies down, where, that, where, that, where that's a, a deeper kind of love and commitment and reality. It's better to be the real thing. Meghan Markle gave up being an actual princess so that she could audition to try to play princesses in Hollywood. That's how backwards our society, we love the semblance of the thing, but we're so afraid of the reality of it because we're afraid of commitment, because we're afraid of commitment, not just to another person, not just to uh, circumstances and a home and a place, but a commitment even to an idea, even to the truth. So we go out and we perform. Even modern spirituality, you know, we make these vague gestures about the universe, man, you know, and like the spirits and the vibes. And, but we don't actually commit to religious belief because that would then impose certain obligations on us. Because if you really think that, you know, your prayers do something, then it, that raises the question, well, how do they do something? Who hears our prayers? Who answers our prayers? What does, what does he, God, demand of us as a result? Uh, of, of that line of thinking. Theology, which is faith-seeking understanding. We don't want any of that. So we just keep making these half-hearted gestures. We just keep playing roles in movies, in, on TikTok, in our daily lives. And that will leave us empty. The, the show is good, but the real thing is a lot better. Now, speaking of the show must go on, got some good news a few days ago. I'm finally getting to it now. You remember... In the spring, I, I gave a talk at the University of Pittsburgh, and this was protested. It was, it was the last in a series of talks. One was with my colleague, Cabot Phillips. One was with Riley Gaines, my fellow Tennessean. And then the final one was me. And the, the left in Pittsburgh and, and Pennsylvania was very upset that I was speaking because at CPAC, I uh, made a comment that was obviously true and uh, which the libs were furious about. But it's a comment that I'm not allowed to say on YouTube. I think you know which one I'm talking about. You know, about eradication from public life entirely. And uh, so there were something like 11,000 signatures against my coming. The university tried to shut it down. The local politicians tried to shut it down. Antifa terrorists tried to shut it down by throwing an explosive at the building while we were walking on stage. Still, though, we were able to go on. They kept threatening. They set the street on fire. They were rioting. At the very end of our, of our debate, the cops basically rushed us off stage and, and out of the building. Um, so we had to cancel the meet and greet, had to cancel some of the events we had afterward. And then the University of Pittsburgh tried to punish the college Republicans for having the audacity to host me by charging them an $18,000, almost $19,000 security fee. And uh, ISI, the group that brought me the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the College Republicans. They, they fought back really hard and Pitt got a lot of bad press and now they are no longer requiring the CRs to pay that fee. That fee was effectively a conservatives on campus fee. That was the fee to say, hey, we're a public university and we're not allowed to stop you from bringing ordinary conservatives to campus, but we're going we're gonna to punish you for it. We're going to bankrupt you if you ever actually do it. And so it was very important that Pitt backed down and those jerks over at Pitt finally called uncle. And that's great news. And it's great news, especially because my new speech season is approaching. We're launching it this month. I'll give you the full rundown of schools in a few weeks. We got some great schools this semester. We're going to launch it September 26th at Georgetown. So if you're in Washington, D.C., Head on over. I think you can reserve tickets now. Uh, so go uh, go check it out. I'll see you in D.C. And please don't throw any explosives at me. And if you do, I hope Georgetown doesn't try to charge us all like 20 grand just for, uh, just for having ducked and missed the explosive. As you know, spooky season is quickly approaching. There will be demons out on the prowl. And I'm not just talking about those woke corporations who look upon your values with disdain. Let's unwoke Halloween 
with Jeremy's chocolate. Our delicious chocolates come in two forms. He, him with nuts mm, and she, her, which are nutless, just as God intended. Don't be a ghoul. Head on over to jeremyschocolate.com and order your uh, chocolates right now in time for Halloween. My favorite comment yesterday is from A. Romano 703 who says, this guy is always teaching me new words. Perspicacious. Wow. Yes, I love that word, perspicacious. Having, having ready insight into things. Perspicacity. Isn't that a good one? I like that. Bill Buckley used to do that. Bill O'Reilly used to do that, too. He just have a word out there that he'd sprinkle in. Perspicacious. Hmm, it's a good one. Which one should I do today? I don't know. I haven't even thought of it. Speaking of schools, great news out of New York. New York City teachers who refuse to get the Fauci ouchie are now going to get their jobs back with back pay. This is according to New York State Supreme Court Judge Ralph Porzio who ruled that the decision to fire 10 employees of the New York Education Department and deny them religious exemptions was unlawful, arbitrary, and capricious. So that's good news. We're so glad to hear it. But unfortunately, this is still a win for the libs because the libs, by passing these mandates, which were obviously illegal and unconstitutional and which over time, when, if people just stood firm, very likely would have been ruled that way as we're seeing around the country and and even in New York. They still used the mandates to pressure everyone else voluntarily to get the jabs. This was the secret story of the mandates. The mandates were were not primarily about getting everyone to take the Fauci ouchie through coercion. The mandates were about getting enough people voluntarily to take the Fauci ouchie, that even if this thing were overruled later on, it wouldn't matter. They would have already gotten what they wanted. What the libs were doing here was asking forgiveness rather than permission, which is generally a good rule in politics. Politics, especially Republican politics, lowercase r, you know, Democratic politics, lowercase d, is about action. It's about things happening very quickly. Sometimes the action happens first, the deliberation happens later. Well, that's what we're seeing here. And they're going to do it again. They're going to try to do the exact same thing again. I hope people stand up. You know, Daily Wire stood up. We took the Biden administration all the way to the Supreme Court and we won. But it's happening. It's happening all around the country. Now, speaking of this issue of immigration and the emergency and the crisis with immigration, you know that New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who's a liberal Democrat, he just came out, he said, this immigration crisis, this is going to destroy New York City. And this is after Eric Adams had said for a long time, we're a sanctuary city, diversity is our strength, everyone's welcome here. But then they started coming after Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis sent buses up to New York, and all of a sudden, Eric Adams changed his tune. Well, now that Eric Adams changed his tune, even the liberals on The View, who are as establishment lib as they get, even they, after years of diversity is our strength and no one is illegal and sanctuary cities are great, they're changing their tune too. This issue will destroy New York City. The city we knew, we're about to lose. But frankly, you know, I think we need to find, and, and we've dealt with this before. I, I lived in, uh, in Miami. I was a migrant, an immigrant in Miami in the 80s. You'll remember when we had the Marielle boat lift. Yes. 125,000 Cubans yeah. came in a matter of six months. It puts tremendous stress on, on, on a city, on a community, on the social services. They need to be resettled elsewhere. That, they need, right? to, they need to be spread out. We're this spread, a massive yeah. country. Well, yeah. And it's only going to get worse with global warming and climate change because people can't <laughs> live in certain parts of this world. And don't forget about this totally unrelated boogeyman. We got to get that in here to every story. <laughs> but, but listen to what Anna Navarro, Anna Navarro is a huge lib. She goes, look, but they got it. We got to spread these immigrants out. We can't. Come on. These immigrants, they're going to destroy New York City. Well, hold on. I thought the immigrants were our strength. I thought we're a nation of immigrants. New York's a city of immigrants. The more immigrants, the better. But then Eric Adams, mayor of New York, changed his tune, and now all the other liberals are changing their tune, too. Why? Because Anna Navarro knows that she's on the same team as Eric Adams. And Eric Adams flipped, and so now the rest of the team is going to flip. This is a concept in political theory that uh, the, 
political boils down to a distinction between friends and enemies. It's, this is uh, something that isn't often spoken about explicitly because it was articulated most clearly by a political philosopher named Carl Schmitt. And Carl Schmitt had the misfortune of being a German in the 1930s, like Heidegger. And so he's, you know, kind of been canceled. But uh, even uh, Leo Strauss, for instance, uh, another great political philosopher, largely exonerates Carl Schmitt of, all, of a lot of the nasty charges against him. And so I, I, think it's, I think it's fair to mention this point because the point he's making here is obviously true, that the political boils down to very practical things. It's not just pie in the sky, guys. It's not just abstractions. It boils down to, are you on my team or are you on, or are you on the other team? Well, if you're on my team, I'm going to show you more grace. If you're on the other team, we're going to try to drive you out of the public square. And I, there are a lot of squishy lib types who bemoan the fact that politics has become so tribal these days. Politics has always been tribal. Poli partisan politics has always been partisan. That's, that's what a party is. And the, the, this notion that there's a distinction between friends and enemies, it actually goes much, much deeper than some political differences. You know, uh, Democrats and Republicans, left and right. It's a, it's a basic question. You know, Ronald Reagan used to say, that uh, we, have, we have no enemies, only opponents here. And so we'd always talk about his Democrat opponents. And there's something really beautifully true about that because if you call your domestic adversaries your enemies, what you're doing is saying that there is no, there's no cohesive political unit here with the right to declare war, with the right to declare who really is an enemy, with the right to really move the entire body politic. And so I, I think it's really beautiful that Ronald Reagan tried to avoid that. Increasingly, though, you hear the left talk about us as enemies, and you hear the right talk about the left as enemies. That tells you about a breakdown in the political order. There is a video that I was hoping to get to today. I'll have to just tease you with this. Though I don't know how tempting this is going to be, because the video is absolutely repulsive. The mayor of Burbank, California, has just subjected himself to being spanked in public by a drag queen. I guess we'll get to it tomorrow. Not because the video is so sensationalist, but because it tells you a lot about the civic religion that is now governing our society. The rest of the show continues now. You know what day it is. It's Tuesday. You don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans.